What is it about the local church? What makes it unique? How does the church impact people's lives? What makes it unlike anything else in the world? It can be difficult to see her for the beauty, joy, and glory that Jesus sees in her. But the truth is that Jesus loves her and proclaims that she is a sacred place. Certainly the church has been set apart by him. The church is God's people, and there is wonder, beauty, and mission to be found in a body of believers united in Christ. When we treasure the local church the way Jesus does, the world can't help but notice and be changed. How are you doing, Rock Church? Good to be with you. I'm back. Uh, you guys are lucky. It's the, uh, there's an event happening tonight, and every uh, other worship leader we have in our church that serves currently is at that event, so you're uh, getting double me. So, Welcome. And my name is Caleb Yetton. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you're with us. We are continuing on in our series, The Church. Uh, this is the third week. We're talking about what is the church? What makes the church significant in the world? Why is the local church special? We want to look at this macro level truth of the church. What does the Bible say about the church? What does it look like to have a biblical understanding of the church and a biblical church? What does a New Testament church look like? We want to discover that. We also want to look at a micro level in this series to look at uh, a, a biblical understanding lived out inside of specific local church, specifically our local church. A uh, local church in Utah is going to look different than a church in New York City, right? It's going to look different than a church in the Bible Belt in the South. Uh, even here in Utah in the Valley, there's different Bible-believing churches, and each of those churches have different flavors and different isms and family language and all these different ways that that biblical truth is expressed within the local church. So we want to unpack some of that as we go along in this series. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a core, one of our core values. We're going to be looking at different core values throughout this series. Why do we do... Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about all of us being ministers of the gospel. And in this series, we'll also talk about why do we do worship a specific way at the Rock Church? Why do we have our pastoral uh, staff and pastor, pastor um, set up in the way that it is? You know, the reason we wanted to do this series in many ways is because honestly, in the last few years, we've had just this massive flux of new folks into our church. By the grace of God, to his glory, we have visitors just about every single week. Uh, just about every single month, we have new folks deciding for the Rock Church to be their church home. And we have uh, all of these new people. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if you're new within the last three years, would you be willing to raise your hand? Yeah, that's a pretty good chunk. Yeah, we, we, the, te uh, the pastors texted this week about what's the percentage of new people over the last few years. Some people thought like 30%, some thought 50%, somewhere in that area. So we have a lot of new folks in our church. And we love to have new folks. But with that comes a lot of uh, teaching people about why we do church specific way, right? We have people that are getting saved left and right, being brought out of a false religion and trusting the Jesus of the Bible and biblical Christianity, we, which is just a glory to God. We have a flux of new folks. It seems like everyone's moving to Utah, right? So we have people that are from out of state and went to a different church. So we want to have a series where we unpack why do we do church the way we do it here? What does it look like practically in Draper, Utah in the 21st century, the Rock Church? What does that look like? And personally, to be honest, I've been very excited about this series. I love the local church. It has changed my life. In particular, this local church here has been such a blessing to me. And this series has just been great. Two weeks ago, you remember Pastor Brian kicked off this series talking about what is the church? that the church is a family and a bride and a body, right? He charged us with the question, Jesus loves the church, do you? Right, he asked us that question last week. Pastor Josh did an amazing job talking about the blessing that the word of God is in our life. And both of those messages were just so encouraging, right? Pastor Josh talked about not just knowing the Bible, not just listening to it, but obeying it, right? So uh, it's been a great series so far. And this week, the title for the message is All Hands on Deck. We're going to be looking at one of our core values at The Rock called Every Member a Minister. Uh, every Christian, 
We believe every Christian, every person in the body of Christ and the family of God is in fact a minister of God. Let me read the core value that we, as we have it posted on our website. It says, all Christians are empowered through the Holy Spirit to be workers in the church, not just the pastors. Therefore, we seek to equip each member to utilize his or her spiritual gifts to serve others. That's good. Amen to that. My prayer in this message is to present to you a biblical basis for this core value that we uh, have here at The Rock, but also uh, I I want us to see how does that play out in our lives? What does that look like in our lives? I think it's important to realize that we have a mission as the church. We are the church, right? The believers, the global church, the local church. We need all hands on deck. That's the message title, if you didn't catch that. So before we pray, let me ask you a question. We'll be thinking about this. Do you see yourself as a minister of God? Do you see that? Is that how you would describe your Christian purpose when you got saved, to be a minister of God? I want you to think about that as we pray. We can Uh, think of how we would answer that and think about that throughout the night. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for tonight. Thank you for a chance to worship you, to come together as a church and to sing to you, God. We need your help now. I pray you'd speak through me. Your Holy Spirit would go before me and just uh, speak your words. Lord, would you convict us? Would you teach us? Would you encourage us, exhort us? Lord, we look to you. We need your help. And uh, we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so let's do this for a second. Christian, I want you to think back. When you came to know Jesus as your Savior, what sort of life were you expecting to live? What sort of life did you think you were entering into as a Christian? What did you feel like you were being called to as you became a Christian? I want to give us an a illustration here, maybe thinking for some might have thought this. I, I think in our Western, modern culture, entering into the Christian life might have seemed to you like you were going on a cruise. And this is not bashing cruises. If you go on cruises, that's great. I I like cruises, cruises, but um, I think maybe specifically entering into a church, sometimes we can hype it up like you're going to go on a cruise, like this idea that it's, life's going to be so much better, it's going to be awesome, it's a stellar, it's this big party, right? You're going to go on these amazing adventures with, with God and with others. You're going to see signs and wonders and perhaps see the world. Of course, yeah, you get your sins forgiven, but all of these other things and your dreams are going to come true and it's incredible. It's like an, a never-ending party, right? There's a feast every day. There's a buffet you can go to any time. You can rest and take naps at the pool, right? You're on a ship with your closest friends. They become like family. It's just amazing. The weather's always great. It might seem to you like, to like the Christian life sometimes like a buffet style, right? It might have been presented to you that way. Or you can even think this. Like you go to a buffet and you're like, I'll take that. I like that, so I'll take plenty of that. I don't like that so much, so I'll push that off to the side, right? It's a pick and choose thing. You disregard what you don't like. And really, there is no pressure in life, right? You're going on a cruise. There's no pressure. You're on vacation all the time, right? There's freedom and grace, and it's just awesome, right? God will take care of it, or he has his cruise staff that will come up and clean up the mess behind you. Every now and again, you might have to do some work, like maybe a fire drill. You got to go out for a stand there for an hour and then go about your business, right? You might have to make your bed every now and again if the staff can't can't come by and make your bed, right? You might experience a storm from time to time, but for the most part, it's just this picturesque, Instagram-worthy lifestyle, right? Have you ever heard the, uh, Christianity be described like that? Like being a part of a church is like that? It's hyped up like this? Maybe not that pointedly, I, I'll give you. But we can hear in our, our society, we can even tell ourselves that the Christian life, God wants us to be happy. He wants us to be living our best life, Right? It's supposed to be all good and enjoyable, and if you don't like it, you can go on another cruise ship, right? If you don't like, you just leave this one, you go to another cruise line if you don't like the one you're at. Of course, knowing Jesus and being part of his church is incredible. I don't want to oppose that. Jesus promises us the full life. He promises us, us amazement and joy and just amazing life knowing him. We have the uh, heaven to look forward to, but... Many times if we look at the Bible, we find a different analogy than this, of what we're being sold in our society. Many times there's an analogy of actually that you're at war, 
right? We hear that. Christianity is like being part of the military, the, being in, uh, a part of the army or navy in this example, right? We, you, uh, we're studying the armor of God at our men's and women's nights right now, and that's been amazing. And I would like to present to us today that the idea of becoming a Christian and thereby becoming the church, because we are the church as God's people, lo- global and local, we are boarding a warship. We're boarding a warship rather than a cruise ship. The truth is, boarding a warship, you will still get adventure, right? You might still see the world and travel and see pretty cool things, but you'll be on a ship filled with people that are your closest friends, and they'll become like family. And of course, with Jesus, you have your sins forgiven, and you, have to look, you can look forward to heaven. Amen. But what we are being called to as Christians, what we are being invited into is a mission. It's a common goal. It is work. Christ is calling his people to do his work. We're called to sacrifice and lay our lives down. Where you sleep might not be as luxurious. It might be a bunk bed, right? Or the food might not be as good all the time. It might be cold sometimes. We're all given orders for our lives from our captain, Jesus, right? It might not always be glamorous and what you thought, but it's good. It's the full life, Absolutely, there will be fun times in this Christian life. You might sometimes throw a ball around on the deck, right? Or jump off into the ocean and swim and laugh and have great times. You might have a day off where you go out at a port and have a day off and relax and sightsee. But you know your lifestyle is you're going back to a warship. We can't be confused. We're not going back to a cruise ship. That's the important thing for us to remember. We're in a battle. In that life, when we think of that way, of being a minister of God in a battle, you will always be brought back to the reality that you are a soldier for Jesus. It's not a lifestyle of picking and choosing. It's not about relaxation and comfort. It is a life lived with purpose to see a battle won, the mission accomplished, to reach the world for the gospel. That is our purpose. That's what we're called to. Understand this, church. It's much easier. Hear me in this. It's much easier to have a soldier who is prepared for war, it's much easier for that soldier to relax when they're given the opportunity than it is for somebody who is uh, sunbathing by a pool to all of a sudden be woken up and say, you're at war. We have to remind ourselves, we have to think of this. We're soldiers and every now and again we get fun and, and laughter and we're in a family. It's not we're at the cruise and oh yeah, I guess I'll, I'll grab my weapon if I have to. At, at, you know, that, I, I, I want us to understand this, to, under, to understand that is the calling of who we are as ministers of God. So let me ask you again, do you see yourself as a minister of God? Do you see your life's purpose as being on mission in a battle, or do you see it as relaxing on a cruise ship? My prayer today is that we will see that the Bible teaches this, our first point, all Christians are called to live a life of gospel ministry. Going back to what is written in our core values, we believe here at the Rock Church that God has called all men and all women who have trusted in Jesus as their savior to be in ministry, to live a life of ministry. It is not just the pastors. It's not just the people who work on staff at this church or at other churches or work at a religious organization. We are all called to be a part of gospel ministry. Let's look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 5 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We often think of that about just with our sins forgiven. The old is new, the old, or the old has passed away, the new has come, right? All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. And then verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Church, we are a new creation, not only that our sins are forgiven, but we are given a new task, a new purpose, a new ministry. This is what the apostles were teaching to the first century church. That's what we want to look to is the Bible, right? The New Testament. What was the church like then? All Christians were given a job in bringing the gospel to the world. That was their purpose. Somewhere in history, though, along the way, unfortunately, the majority of the Christian church lost this. They got away from this, sadly. It became a standard practice for only clergy or pastors or priests or whatever you want to call them, for them only to do the work of the gospel. And you never expect a lay person, one of you attending church, to share the gospel or do the work of ministry. That was the pastor's job. The rest of the church just showed up. 
and they heard a sermon, and maybe they sang a few songs, they took communion, they might have said hi to somebody along the way, and then they went back to their day, right? Back to their real job. Sadly, this was a failing of many churches throughout history and pastors throughout history. By the way, Pastor Bill is going to talk about church leadership and, and pastors and why we do that in, a, in the certain way that we do next week. So come back to hear that, and we're going to look at some verses here. But when it talks about elder and shepherd and teacher, we believe all that's the same, but you'll hear more about that next week. But for centuries, I believe the majority of the church as a whole failed to follow Paul's instructions here and in Ephesians. Let's look at Ephesians 4. It says, uh, Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So we see here in the first century, the shepherds, teachers, pastors, whatever you want to call them, they had a job to do. It was a gospel ministry. Yes, of course, we know that. Part of their gospel ministry was to prepare the church, the saints, the body of Christ to join in in that gospel ministry. And that's our prayer and our hope as pastors here at this church that we would do this. That's part of why we're doing this series, right? He, for you guys here at The Rock to be equipped to work as ministers of God here in this church, at your homes, in your families, at your workplace, in your neighborhood, in this city, that wherever we go, we would be doing the ministry of the gospel. Until, for some of you, that might be to the ends of the earth. God might call you to go to some place that's unreached, and hallelujah. We want to equip the church for that ministry. You guys know who Uncle Sam is, right? Uncle Sam, uh, Uncle Sam was used by the U.S. government, has been a character, this guy on posters who would point out and say, I want you for the U.S. Army, right? It's been used throughout history, uh, U.S. history, to, since the 1800s to get people on board to join the military, especially at times of war. It's a calling, a calling to something greater than themse themselves, right? He tried to stir up American citizens to give their life for a cause. For me, when I was 18 years old, I was walking into a church, the Rock Church, at a different location, but I, I wasn't knowing what my next step was going to be. What was I going to give my life to? I was in a place of I didn't know what my next step was. What was I going to center my whole life around? My job and my finances and my passions and my affections and eventually my family. What was going to be the thing I was going to give my life to? And I walked into this little church in 21st South. And I heard from the pastors there that were speaking about this gospel ministry that they were calling me to. This opportunity to give my life for the gospel in every part of my life. It was like I was walking down the street. It, uh, it was like I was walking down the street and I saw this poster. Uncle Bill <laughs> was, uh, he was pointing at me. And he was like, I want you to give your life for the gospel. And I was like, Uncle Bill, I'm going to do that. I, God, God won my heart. And he, I, I set up my whole life to be on mission. Every part of it, whether it was my job or where I lived, all of those things were funneled through what is my gospel ministry. This was years before I ever became a pastor. It was years before I ever thought about doing full-time ministry. But all of a sudden, I saw the truth in God's word that was calling me to a gospel ministry that changed my life. And he's calling you to do the same. He is. If you're a Christian, he's calling you to do that. If you're not a Christian, he's calling you to be saved and do that. Join him in that ministry. Truths like these change my life. We don't have time to look at all of them. We'll discuss a few of them as we go along here for the rest of our time. I want you to take a picture or, or it's on your handout. Uh, I would love for you to read these verses this week, to believe these truths, Christian, to believe the truths that changed my life, that we are created for ministry. This isn't, again, not that you're a full-time minister. This is your, your life as a Christian, created for ministry, gifted for ministry. God has commissioned you for ministry. He's instructed you to minister. He needs, he has, we are needed for ministry. And we are rewarded for our ministry. In heaven, we will be rewarded for our, our ministry. I want you to read these verses and let this sink in this week. Before we move on to end this point, I, I just appreciated this quote from Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary to China. He had a change of perspective on this. He said, I used to ask God to help me. Then I asked if I might help him to do his work through me. I just say amen to that. So our next idea that we're going to look at, point two, 
is each Christian has been given a unique gift that is meant to be used to build up the body of Christ, to proclaim the gospel to the lost, and to bring glory to God. To live out the gospel ministry that we have been called to, we must know that God has equipped us for ministry. He has equipped each of us, each of you, all of us, he has equipped us in each a unique way. We're not all engineers, type A personalities that like charts and graphs like Bill and Josh, right? We're not all that way, but God uses that gift, that uniqueness in a way. He uses it, and it to his glory, and it blesses the church, and it wins people. We're not all scattered brain musicians that cry and fuss about everything like Steele and I, right? <laughs> mostly Steele, mostly Steele, but uh, no. God somehow uses that too, right? Uses our, our, our frailness, but he uses that giftedness there to bless people. We are each uniquely gifted and we are called to use the gifting to serve and bless the local church and the people in it. That's the people in it, not just the organization, right? We are called to use that gift to share the gospel to those around us, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family who need Jesus. And we're called to use that gift as an act of worship. Do you know your gift is an act of worship? You can worship God with what he's given you. It's not just here on a, a Saturday night that we worship. We worship with our lives, with, his, with the gift he's given us. Let's read some verses that apply to blessing the church specifically. First Peter 4 says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Also, I want to read part of uh, 1 Corinthians 12. That's a great chapter too. If you want some homework this week, read 1 Corinthians 12. There's a lot of great verses about our service and our ministry and our gifts that God has given us. This chapter has a lot to say about that, but we're going to look at verses 4 through 7 right now. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in, in everyone. And then catch this. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You see that? God has gifted us as a means to serve each other, right? And we saw that in 1 Peter. And also here in 1 Corinthians 12, he empowers us to do for the common good. That's so good. We are empowered. Christian, you are empowered by God's spirit. When you are empowered by the almighty God, that is great power. And with great power comes responsibility, right? What did Uncle Ben say? Right? We're like Spider-Man. We're greater than Spider-Man. We've been empowered by the almighty God to do his work for the common good. Christian, you are called to serve the body of Christ in the ways that Jesus has gifted you. Are you doing that? Of course, we also are called to use our gifts to spread the good news of the gospel, right, to the world. Philippians 2 says this, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So good. Guys, our, our lives of ministry and service to God and the church speak to the world, right? Many times more than words do, especially when they won't pick up the Bible, right? Or they won't listen to us talk about the Bible, right? Many people have said throughout the years, be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible that a person ever reads. Your life is a testimony. How are you using your life and your gifts and the things that God has given you in your service to the church and those around you? How are you using that to point people to Jesus? Are they seeing it? Let me ask you this. How can you live a life of gospel ministry? What does it look like for you? What does it look like in your family, in your neighborhood, in the, in the pace of life that you have? What does that look like for you? How can you? God, you need to know this is our heart as pastors at this church, at The Rock. We, again, it's not just the pastors that do this work. We rely so heavily on so many of you 
to do ministry, to serve, to get church service running, to do things week in and week out. It is our heart as pastors to stoke the fire that God has put into his people. If you're passionate about something for the gospel, for the kingdom, we want to stoke that fire. If it's music or photography or videography or it's art or it's serving someone in the community or in our church or it's spreadsheets or organization, right? We need people who do that too. We, if it's health and fitness or if it's evangelism, street evangelism or one-on-one -on -one evangelism, what that may be, we want to stoke that fire if you're passionate about it. Whatever it is, we want to support you and say, do all of it for the glory of God. Go do it. If you can do it, if God puts it on your heart, we want to know how to support you. We want to encourage the saints to spread the gospel. We would love to talk to you about that. We'd love to pray about that with you and see what God might have for you. Come talk to us. We would love it. But also, if I might add this, there is something to be said about the practical needs of the local church those that need to be covered and things that can use your giftedness in that area in practical ways, maybe in ways you don't even know. You need to know there are needs. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of slots every single service and three services per weekend of, of volunteers that we rely on you guys to fill it. Every single service, whether it's greeting or coffee or setup or storefront or childcare or lights, media, sound, all of it, we need your help. You. 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 We need your help. You may say, well, it's not my gifting. I, I wouldn't want to do that. I I'm not good with kids. I'm not good. Whatever it may be. I'm I'm let me just say this. If, if you're at your house and in your family and you're like, I'm really gifted at car work, the dishes still have to get done. The trash still has to be taken out. The floor still has to get cleaned. Oh, I'm not gifted for that. Well, then you live in a dirty home, right? If you only do in your life what you're gifted at, I don't know what else you, what else you do with your life, but there is a need that God can use you. If you want to help, if you want to help serve in this church, come talk to me. Go to the Connections booth. We have a volunteer form. I'd love for you to fill that out tonight. Email me. It's on the back of my handout. It's on our website. Please, we need more help all the time. There's more to be done. And we would love to talk to you about what you could help us with and be passionate about. The reason that this is important, the reason that we try to put our best foot forward at this local church week in and week out is because we believe this, point three, the local church body is the vehicle God uses to change the world. I believe this. I've seen it in my own life. This is true. Two weeks ago, Pastor Brian talked about us being the body, right? God works through his body to change the world. That's the truth. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. He's not here physically. We are. He will work through us, his body, to change the world. William McDonald wrote this in the Believer's Bible Commentary. I appreciated it. He said, just as the human body is a vehicle by which a person expresses himself to others, so the body of Christ is the vehicle on earth by which he chooses to make himself known to the world. Amen. He wrote this in the commentary specifically about 1 Corinthians 12, which we're gonna look at again. It's, again, it's a rich chapter about the body of Christ. Let's read again in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to look at verse 12, 14, and 19, and kind of jump around all the way to verse 30. But speaking about God using his body, verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. It, uh, Paul goes on in verses 8 through 10 to list a number of different gifts that the body has been given, right? Whether that's uh, one part is given wisdom or knowledge or faith or gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, tongues, on and on. He goes on, but then he, he eventually says in verse 27 to 30, he says, Now you are the body of Christ, speaking to the believer. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating. Some of you are like, awesome, administrating. That's in the Bible. 
Good for you. Uh, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Pastor Brian talked about this, right? We can't all be the eyebrow, right? That would just be terrifying, <laughs> right? We get this picture of the whole body working together to accomplish one ultimate goal. And for that body of, the, of Christ, the body of Christ, that goal is the Great Commission, right? To make disciples of all nations, to baptize those disciples, to teach them and to then send them out to go reach others and eventually reach the ends of the world. Each part of the body is unique and has an integral part, an integral job to do. It's needed. All of it's needed. And just like in our human bodies, right, if one part isn't working, everything suffers, even if it's the smallest, most unassuming part of your body, right? If that's not working right, if it's hurting, if it's separated, if it's affected, the rest of the body is affected, right? Last week in my life, last week, uh, I just messed up my neck. I've, I've had a couple injuries to my neck. I was in a few car accidents that have really messed up my neck, and at times, I'll kink it. And literally, it just everything tightens up, shoulders, neck, and I just literally sometimes have to do this for a day or two. I can't move. It debilitates me at times, honestly. And it's just this small little piece in my neck, and the re the, my whole body is useless, it feels like. Josh told me last week I needed to work on my strengthening and, and pliability, right? Like Tom Brady and TB12 method. I appreciated you saying that, Josh. Not that it's helping Tom this year, but, uh, but anyway, I need to get some bands and strengthen my neck. And the point is my sore neck, the muscles hurting in my neck, not being engaged, affected my usefulness. I couldn't pick up my kids, right? I, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do, so I had did some activities that I was able to like just look down and use my arms, but anything beyond this, it was just rough. So it is in the church, Right? If we are not fulfilling the work of the body, if you are not fulfilling the job that you have in the whole body, that small piece, may it be, it affects the whole church. It just does. It has already been said, right, that we can't be all doing the same service, right? It said that in 1 Corinthians. We can't all be doing the same work. There is an integral job that each one of us has, and we need to find what that is. Many times that might be something behind the scenes that no one ever sees when no one's watching, but you're work, working unto the Lord, serving unto the Lord. It truly blesses the body. It brings glory to God and it can be used to see people saved. And again, there's a lot of work to be done. So many of you are such great examples of this, really. We're blessed. We have so many amazing servants and I just want to commend you. If you are serving, we want to say thank you. If you're not serving, we would love to to help you join in with us because we need help. Guys, you need to understand we have such a unique opportunity here at the Rock Church in Draper, Utah. What we see week in and week out is not like other churches. We talk to pastors around the country. If they get one visitor a year, they're elated. We get just flooded with visitors. We, we, we want to be faithful with, with what God has given us. We want to put our best foot forward in our services and in our small groups, in our Rock Cares service projects, in our loving and serving our community, in our Rocktober out, Rocktoberfest outreach, whatever it may be, we want to do that well because it speaks to the people that Jesus loves them, right? It speaks to people, Jesus loves you and he wants you to be a part of something. He wants to save you. I think we see a beautiful picture in Acts 2 with the first church in Jerusalem. Every time I think of how a church should function, a local church, I think of this beautiful picture in Acts 2. It's, it's really a picture of the body working together, serving and loving, and each person using their gift for the gospel ministry for the greater good. Acts 2 says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. 
They received their food and with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I'm not saying we should all sell our possessions and move and have a compound. I'm not saying that. Don't hear me from that. Many people hear, read that and like, what are you asking me to do? But if we see there's this true sense of community, true fellowship, true service and giving of themselves, committed to one another, right? It can be showing hospitality in homes. It can be caring for the sick and the orphan and the widow, having it be throughout your whole life, this ministry for the gospel, for the church, for the lost, for the glory of God. There's a willingness to give of oneself and to sacrifice for others. And God used that first church, the very first church group, he used it to change the world and he's doing that still through each local church throughout the world. Really, this first church was walking out the example that was given to them by Jesus himself. Our captain, our commanding officer, our king gave us a great example to serve one another. Jesus is our example. We need to look at what he did. You know, many people want the ministry of Jesus or what they think was the full ministry of Jesus, right? They wanna draw crowds, they wanna teach and lead and be influential and show how great of a leader they are. Maybe people want to show how wise and, and, and righteous they are and rebuke Pharisees and religious snobs, right? They think, man, I would love to have that job. That's the example that Jesus gave us. But that wasn't all of Jesus' ministry, right? In fact, he spoke to us what was part of his ministry. We see what he said was our example and what we should do. He said it in Mark 10 when speaking about the world's way of doing things, where, the, where people, uh, those in power, leaders, were taking advantage and lording it over others. Jesus said this in Mark 10, it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus went so far as to show it, right? He didn't just say it. He set the example of doing it when he washed his disciples' feet. This is part of Christ's ministry that can be so easily forgotten or ignored because it's not as flashy and great and who wants to wash feet, right? Right? We can talk about gifting and finding what fits us, right, and what we're gonna thrive in, and what we're passionate about. But there's an element of following the words and examples of, uh, example of Jesus. Think about that, the king of the universe. Are you greater than the king of the universe? Are you more important? Are you more gifted than the creator of all things, the Lord of heaven who in this moment was holding all things together in the universe while at the same time washing his disciples' feet, dirty and gross and covered in dirt and grime. This is the example Jesus set before us. He wasn't too important or great to give time to the sick and to the leper and heal them and love them and hug them and go to the sick and the outcast. He said as much in John 13, right? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example and that you also should do just as I have done for you. This is beautiful right? There is absolutely something to be said about using the unique gift that God has given you to serve his kingdom and his church. Amen. There, that is true. There's something about finding that sweet spot. But can I also say there's a lot to be said about a practical need of cleaning the floor or watching the kiddos or taking out the trash or, and some of that, some of those things don't need a spiritual gift. Someone's got to do it. I sometimes think back to when I joined this church 15 years ago and uh, Billy, Pastor Billy was like, hey, we need someone to clean the toilets and we need somebody to mop the floor, right? I feel like so spoiled at times that we like pay a cleaning crew to clean this once a week, right? Like, oh, yeah, I'm too good for that. I, I sound like an old man. Back in my day. Uh, <laughs> sometimes though I feel spoiled in that. There's a real sense of following the example of Jesus and, and saying, if you want to be great, if you want to be like Jesus, get on your hands and knees and serve. Clean. Serve. Love somebody. Do a dirty job that nobody else wants to do. 
There's a practical step of loving God in a practical way by loving and serving his people and loving the visitors that come here and saying, I will humbly serve and maybe I'll do some grunt work to show somebody that I love them and I care for them and they're welcome here. I'll, I'll humble myself. And a lot of that is taking the time to do it, right? This uh, secular author and poet, Leo Christopher, he understood the importance of this, of showing people how you care with your time. There's only one thing more precious than our time, and that's who we spend it on. I know it's easy to think we're, we're busy. I'm too busy, right? I'm too busy to serve. I'm too busy to do that event. I'm too busy to, to commit to one month on, two months off. I'm too busy to commit to that. Or, or I'm, I'm even too busy to serve my family. Well, if you're not serving your family, you should change that. You should remove some things in your life so you serve your family. I would agree with Mr. Christopher here that in... It says something about how much we value those people if our time is used for something else other than serving them. So as we're coming to an end here, and we see the example of Jesus, how he set for us, I want to take the question that Pastor Brian gave us two weeks ago, and I just want to add a couple words and have us ask ourselves as we leave here. Jesus loves and serves the church. Do I? Let's be honest with ourselves. Do we? Do I? Do you? If someone looked at your life right now and they saw all the time that you spend in your entire life and the energy and the passion that you poured into your whole life, would they say, man, that guy really loves Jesus? That guy really loves the church? That guy really loves the lost? That gal, man, she serves people. She must really love them. Would they see that you are giving up your time and your energy to love the body of Christ? to love the lost, to preach the gospel, to give God glory, would that be said of us as individuals here? Would that be said of us as a church? To bring it back to where we started, there's a lot of work to be done. We need all hands on deck, church. Jesus said there is a harvest, there is a work, it is plentiful, a work of gathering the lost, of spreading the gospel, of winning people to Christ, and we need to pray for more workers to join with us, but we also need to join in. We're called to participate in that work. We need the whole body. We need people to say, I'll join the battle and see my life as a calling to serve the king, a gospel ministry. I'll join in. I'll, I'll chip in. My prayer is that would be true of us at the Rock Church. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We just thank you for what you've done for us, the example you set for us, Jesus. Thank you that you have made us your people. You have made us your church your bride, Lord, and you have said that we should follow your example. Thank you that we don't have to guess what that looks like, Lord. Thank you that we don't have to be confused about what you would have us do, Lord. I pray you'd help us as a church to give of ourselves, to be more like you, to love people, to love the lost, to care for them, to care more about them than we do ourselves, Lord. Would you help us in that? We need your help. I pray that we would be honest with ourselves as we leave here tonight with that question, you love the church and you serve the church, do I? What would you have us do, Lord? Answer that for us, put it on our hearts. Pray you would answer that for us and guide us and lead us and we just love you and we pray all this in your name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's, let's stand up and we'll sing one more song.